I uh, joined the Air Force in June of uh, 1952, and uh, it was uh, because of the war going on, and rather than to wait for draft, well, I joined the Air Force. I was only in the basic training in uh, uh, Parks Air Force Base, then Wichita Falls, Texas for A&E School, Chinook Field for R4360 School, and was assigned to, to Walker and reported on uh, the 3rd of May of 53. I was assigned uh, uh, to a B-36 uh, ground crew where I became crew chief for uh, Aircraft 2681 and I crewed that plane until June of, of uh, 56. Well, it, it, again, we were responsible for the, uh, all the flight discrepancies, repairing those, keeping the plane ready for deployment and uh, we made two rotations to Thule, Greenland, one in, in uh, 50. Four, uh, October 54 and again in February 55. I was very fortunate. Uh, the planes was in reasonably good shape when we uh, arrived Thule. Uh, although there was a phase three the, at, on our last uh, deployment to uh, Thule that kept most of the planes there, uh, they had quite difficulty. A, a, a lot of props were uh, destroyed at that time because of uh, blowing snow. And that's probably one of the things I, my plane was fortunate to be in good shape, we flew out before that happened. Uh, maintaining the plane, it was uh, a very difficult plane with six uh, reciprocating engines and four jets. It kept the ground crews very busy uh, just maintaining that plane uh, ready for flight. Our squadron had a requirement of 400 hours per month and to fly 60 or 70 hours a month on the planes that was available was very difficult during that time. It was a very difficult uh, high maintenance uh, airplane. I think the deployment uh, in the Thule Greenland areas uh, that went from such a, a different climate from Walker to Thule and back, although I also took a deployment in uh, Guam in October of, of uh, 55 to, to uh, February 56, but uh, Green, Greenland was the most challenging one. Well, uh, it's it seemed like Again, we left here and went to Washington State to pick up the units and from there to Honolulu to, and uh, to Guam. Uh, but it was, uh, no particular situations happened. We did have a lot of accidents and incidents uh, while we were on Guam, but uh, most of it was uh, with other aircraft. So. They were uh, situations that could have happened at any time or anywhere, but uh, it was something that did affect our capabilities some, and, uh, and it was a challenge for the ground crews to keep the planes because of the high humidity and uh, the challenges that was on an a island like Guam. Well, it was very difficult. Uh, that we worked very good together, uh, and a lot of support people. Uh, naturally, we was, there was only four people with the ground crew, with the crew chief, but we had post-flight docks, and then uh, all of our support groups from field maintenance, which was uh, instrumentation, electrical, A&E, uh, armament, all of those people were very supportive, and uh, it was uh, just a good group, support group, that kept the planes flying. Yes, I hired in with uh, a Lockheed Missiles and Space Company directly after that, uh, and worked at Holloman Air Force Base uh, on B-50s and B-29s. I was in a launch aircraft that launched X-7s and Q-5 missiles for the Nike Hercules as targets, and from there I went to Vandenberg Air Force Base, and I was a uh, launch technician uh, for, uh, worked on the Atlas Agena programs and uh, the Titan programs, and we, the payloads that we launched were strictly for NSA and NRO, and I worked there until 1978 when I went into human resources, and from there I went to Charleston, South Carolina, worked in the fleet ballistic missile systems on the submarines, and when SWIP Lant uh, was activated, the submarine base at Kings Bay, Georgia, I was there and worked in human resources, and we staffed that with a little over uh, 700 people, and I retired in 2000 and moved back to Lompoc, California, and that's where I reside now.